Welcome back. Thanks for joining us again today for our Sunrise Church podcast. We've been very encouraged by um, all of your emails, and we'd love to hear more. So if you have a story to share about how this ministry has somehow touched your life, um, please email us at yourstory@sunriseministries.ca. Also, if you'd like to give financially to this ministry uh, so that we can bring more messages like, like this to you every week, um, then please visit our website at www.sunriseministries.ca, and you can click on the Donate Now button. Well, today we continue on with the series, Love, No Strings Attached, with part four, uh, entitled, Let's Love Like That. Today we are going to learn how to love God's way. So please keep your ears and your hearts open uh, to receive a word from God today. So let's pray God's blessing upon this word. Father, I pray you will bless this word. Let the anointing be here. God, I pray you'll take this servant who can do nothing without you. And I pray that not one word that comes out of my mouth, God, will come out in vain. But God, I pray it would touch each and every heart in this house. And I thank you for life-changing encounters with the King of Glory today. And that people will leave this place knowing his love and knowing that they have the love like that. I pray for that in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. I want to read a little story here. A woman writes her ex a love letter. She says this, Dearest Jimmy, no words could express, never ever express, the great unhappiness I felt since breaking our engagement. Please say you'll take me back. No one could ever take your place in my heart. So please, please forgive me. I love you. I love you. I love you. Yours forever, Sally. P.S. Congratulations on winning the lottery. Isn't that the way the world works? Isn't that the way the love is? That you get to know someone and you find out certain things about them. And when you find out those certain things or what they have or what they may have or what they're in store for. And you look and you say, that's a good candidate to love. I'll set my life out right there. And so many people have their love. And we talked about this based on what can be done. If you love me, I will love you. If, if you do this for me, I'll do this for you. And if you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back. But instead of taking the God's kind of love is that I love you, period. So I want to take us to some scripture today and look at his love. John chapter 13, verse 34. Let's begin there. We've read the scripture already, but we're going to read it again just so it's fresh in your mind and lays the foundation for where we're going. He says this in verse 34 of John chapter 13, I give you a new commandment that you should love one another just as I have loved you. So you too should love one another. Let me ask this question. Does he love you? No. No. You're unsure? After three messages of love, you should know that he loves you. Let me ask you a question. Does he love you? Does he love you? Yes, he loves you. And he says, you should love others the same way I have loved you. Let me ask you this question and answer it with a clear conscience. I hopefully, or don't answer at all. Do you love people like he loves you? <laughs> My answer will be, sometimes. <laughs> And I believe most of us in this house would be sometimes. Our goal is to be all times. Our goal is to work on that so we can love people like he loves them. And that is not the easiest thing to do. John chapter 3 verse 19. The basis of the judgment, indictment, the test by which men are judged, the ground for the sentence lies in this. That light has come into the world and the people have loved the darkness Rather than and more than the light, for their works and deeds were evil. People love the darkness rather than the light. And God is calling us to love like He loves. And let me tell you, you can't love like He loves in darkness. You need the light, and He is the light. Going on, let's keep moving. John chapter 12, verse 44. John chapter 12, verse 44. And this is what he says. But Jesus loudly declared. 
He wanted to get his point across. How many know when you want to get a point across, a lot of times you shout or you say it clear or you just make sure that people can hear you. Jesus loudly declared, the one who believes in me does not only believe in and trust in and rely on me, but in believing in me, he believes in him who sent me. God sent his son, Jesus. If you believe in Jesus, you believe in him who sent him. And whoever sees me sees him who sent me. If you see Jesus, you see God. You want to know what Jesus is like, what God is like? You want to know God's heart? You want to know how God acts? Follow the life of Jesus. Pay attention to the letters in red. Listen to what other people said about him. Learn about Jesus and you will learn about God. I have come as a light. People have loved darkness rather than light. People have loved evil rather than Jesus, the light. I have come as a light into the world so that whoever believes in me Whoever cleaves to and trusts in and relies on me may not continue to live in darkness. If you go to the light, Jesus, if you accept him, you don't have to live in darkness. He is light. I want to say this, and I want you to agree with me. I want you to say in your own heart, I don't live in darkness. You live in light. If anyone hears my teachings and fails to observe and do them, not keep them, but disregards them, it is not high who judges him. Wow, interesting, isn't it? Jesus said, if people don't listen to my teachings, it's not I who judges him. Church, if the world don't listen to his teachings, it's not Jesus, it says here, that judges him. How many know if it's not, it should be no more you. You don't have the place. He has the right. And he says, it's not me. For I have not come to judge and to get them and to pass sentence and to inflict penalty on the world, but to save the world. Jesus didn't come to point a finger. Jesus didn't come to come down on people. Jesus didn't come to make people feel little. He come to love the world. He speaks Jesus' truth. Let me know what he's saying here is truth. He says in verse 48, anyone who rejects me persistently sets me at naught, refusing to accept my teaching as his judgment, however. So how many old people will be judged? You will be judged. We will be judged. The world will be judged. But he says, for the very message I have spoken will itself judge and convict him on the last day. There is a last day, church. There is a time coming. And I want to say this. I believe for far too long there's been a church that has had their fingers pointed or have had their their eyes glanced in a direction with a look of disappointment as opposed to having their eyes looking at a world with a heart of love and arms opened up to love them. We've looked at them and said, look at what they're doing. I can't believe they've done that. Why are they doing that? They can't get this message. I don't understand why they believe this way. Don't they see what I see? Would you just... How many Christians have I talked to that have been sitting down with people in a debate? It's okay to have a healthy debate. But if somebody don't believe what you believe, don't dare get mad at them. Oh, you just don't understand. Oh, yeah, that's really going to make them believe. <laughs> They're going to see the opposite of who Jesus is in you. They're going to see something different. They're going to see not light, but they're going to see darkness, and they're going to see judgment, and they're going to see someone who's frustrated because you just don't see it my way. Instead, to love somebody no matter what they believe. That's why I can sit with anybody on the face of this planet. And when I sit with them, still love them. I say this so often. I've told people, I say, I pray that I'll have the kind of love that if someone comes in and spits in my face, I can look back at them with a smile and say, that was an accident. I still love you. That's okay. You must have just spit when you were talking. Praise God. If someone punched me in the face, I'd say, oh, sorry, your hand must have slipped. But we so often don't have that attitude or that heart. But we're going to see Jesus. Everybody say, let's see Jesus. 
as he is in the world, so you be also. Okay, so we are called to be Jesus in the world. So if we're called to be Jesus in the world, let me ask a question. Why is it that the church don't walk like Jesus like it should walk like Jesus? Well, pastor, we're just human. <laughs> we all make mistakes. Stop making excuses. Are all those things true? Yes. Do we all make mistakes? Yes. But stop dwelling on the excuse to excuse yourself from being who Jesus called you to be. Because I, I'm getting ahead of myself here and getting ready to preach something that I'm moving into. But i got to say it because the fact of the matter is we might be just human. We might be just in this natural world. But the Holy Ghost has got a hold of some of us that when we walk, the Spirit of God walks with us, talks with us, and leads us. We got something different, church. Now, we can get caught up in this way of doing things, or we can get caught up with the truth. He says, I didn't come to judge the world. Anyone who rejects me, he says, he said, I will ever have a judgment on his last day because it's my word that will judge him. This is because I have never spoken on my own authority or of my own accord or as self-appointed, but the Father who sent me has himself given me orders concerning what to say and what to tell. So on the last day, what he said, regardless of people believe it when you tell them or not, is the truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Our responsibility is to tell the truth and to tell the truth in love. Whether someone believes it or not is not your responsibility to try to convince them. Because if you, and I've said this before, if you've got to convince somebody to come to Jesus, you're going to have to convince them to stay. But if you go in the anointing and love them like Jesus loved them, share the gospel like Jesus shared it with his life, let me tell you, you will see people coming to Jesus and staying in a relationship with him. He said, I didn't come to judge the world. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. Beloved, let me, let me say before I move on to this, Matthew 24 says, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. And it's the word, what he said is going to pass that judgment. It's the truth. 1 John chapter 4. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God. It springs from God. And he who loves his fellow man is begotten, is born of God, and is coming progressively to know and understand God, to perceive and recognize and get better, clearer knowledge of him. I said this a few Sundays back. The more that you get close to Jesus, the more you're going to love people. If you find yourself not loving people, you need to get close to Jesus. He said this, he said this right here. This word, right here, this is how we know that we're coming to know and understand God, to perceive and get better and clearer knowledge of him. And this is how. He who does not love has not become acquainted with God, does not and never did know him, for God is love. If you find yourself not loving people, you need to go and get right with Jesus. Amen? Because love springs from God. It goes on to say, in this, the love of God was made manifest, displayed where we are concerned, in that God sent his son, the only begotten, unique son, into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, if God loved us so very much, we also ought to love one another. If he loved us like that, we ought to love one another. Last Sunday, I shared with you that in, in, in Jeremiah, it says, who can know the heart? The heart is evil above imagination. Who can know it? And I went on to share how if we try to love out of the heart that we had, that we were born with, then we're not going to be able to love like he loves. But when God comes in and we let his love flow through us, we can love like he loves. So this is love. Not that we loved God but that he loved us. Now let me paint a picture of it. And I pray that your eyes will be open so clear. The book of Isaiah chapter 3 is where we're going to spend some time. But before chapter 3, I want you to look at a guy by the name of Hosea. 
Now, Hosea, he was a prophet, and God came and spoke to him, and he spoke to him 700, I believe, years before Jesus came. And the word of the Lord came to Hosea, and he told him this. Now, if you haven't read the book of Hosea, then get ready, because this is a shocker. He said, Hosea, go and take for yourself a white wife of harlotry. Go and marry a prostitute. God, I mean, if it was me, I'd be like, okay, something wrong with my ears today. Uh, can't be right. Go and marry a prostitute. Hosea goes and he, he finds this woman by the name of Gomer. Not Homer. Gomer. I, I don't, is there, I hope there's no one named Gomer here or anybody ever watches online named Gomer because I can't th imagine anybody else ever naming their daughter Gomer. But this is her name. And he goes to Gomer, Gomer and he says, I'm going to marry you. Now, he marries her. He takes her as his wife, listening to the heart of God, listening to what he said. And he brings her into his home. And they have a child. They have a little boy. And then they go on and they have another child. They have a little girl. For, for like three years, they were busy. All right? Three babies. She's been with them for three, maybe four years. I'm not sure. They got a boy. They got a girl. And they got another boy. And then he comes home one day. Daddy gets in the house. He walks in through the door. And he smells an aroma in the air. Perfume. He notices that some of the clothes has been gone through. And he says, there's something different here. Maybe she's got a surprise for me. Maybe she's getting all dressed up and cooked a fancy meal. Maybe, I don't know. But, but my wife got something prepared for me. And he walks into the door and he's all excited and he smells the aroma and he looks and she's not there. He searches for her throughout the home. He's got three kids in the house. But Gomer has left the house. Gone. Now you got a single daddy. He's home, three kids to manage, life to manage, diapers to change if you would. And she leaves. She doesn't come back the next day. And she don't even come back the next day. And he waits and he said, for sure, something's happened. What's going on? And then he realizes, because how many know good news travels fast, but bad news travels faster? And I believe he might have been sitting at home and heard that she's back on the city street. She's back on the block and she's selling herself again. Because scripture talked about how he would go after those who give her fine linen and those who give her the milk and the honey. Those who give her stuff and she goes back to what she knew and she's there in the presence of these men. And now he's at home thinking, God, what were you thinking? You told me to marry this woman and now she's left and I'm here with three kids. I can't do this, God. Why? How many of us would answer in such a way? How many of us would be broken down and thinking, where do we go from here? I don't know how to continue. But here he is, the prophet Hosea, and God speaks to him once again. In chapter 3, he says this. And the Lord said to me, go again. God, make this real. Go again. Love the same woman, Gomer, who is beloved of a promor, a man that's not hers, a man that's not her husband, and is an adulteress. Even as the Lord loves the children of Israel, and right here, yes, it's Israel, but I want to tell you, he is speaking still. If you read the Old Testament, it's the New Testament concealed, and in the New Testament, it's the Old Testament revealed, and he is still speaking of the whosoever will, and he's saying, go and love her just as I love the children of Israel. Though they turn to other gods and love cakes of raisins and used in sacrificial feasts and idol worship, 
He said, go. Love the same woman. Church, Adam and Eve walk in the garden in the cool of the day with a God who loves them so much and created them and looked at them and said, it is good. And then he comes back down to the garden and when he comes, he sees that they have been disobedient and they have not listened to the God, the Father who loves them and they betrayed him in such a way that they eat of the tree. The one he said, don't eat of this tree, but yet they did and now God sees them because he sees all. His children. So I bought her. I can see him walking through the streets. Does anybody know? I'm trying to get the words out. But Gomer, my wife, where she is. see people saying, oh, that's Hosea. He must be hurting so bad. That's, I know where she's too, Hosea. I don't ever want to tell you. I, I just need you to tell me where she is. Where is Gomer? I, Hosea, I, I just shouldn't tell you right now. No, no, don't. please tell me. I have to find her. He said, at last I seen her. She's down. She's being sold. I can picture him walking in to a place where slaves are sold because he bought her for the price of a slave which was 30 pieces of silver and he, he took 15 pieces of silver and some, some, some wheat and stuff and, and bought her with this. But can you imagine walking in and as he walks in, there are people being sold into slavery and he stands there and up on the auction block comes Gomer. She's stripped naked so people can see her and people can buy her and wondering if they're getting a good deal. And as she stands here, she opens her eyes and in through the room walks a man who loved her. A man who fed her, who sat her, her children on his knee and loved them. The shame, the guilt, the wanting to run away, but she can't, she's in chains. The wanting to get away from this man, but she can't leave. She's being sold. And here she stands. Nothing left. Broken down once again. And Gomer walks in and people are saying, she's been around. I'll give you five pieces of silver now. I'm paraphrasing, emphasizing a little bit. I, I'll give. And Gomer stood there. And she's thinking, he just come to beat up. He just come because he's angry. He just come because, and she's thinking, why is he here? I don't want him to see me like this. And from the room, a voice probably could have been heard something like this. I'll buy her for 30 pieces of silver. Isn't it interesting that Jesus was betrayed for a lousy 30 pieces of silver? I'll buy her. She looks up thinking, what's happening? I can picture Hosea taking his robe probably off or some cloak and wrapping it around her and taking her with him now because she's his wife. The world, I believe right now, whether they know it or not, are so many of them are in the slavery of sin. They are feeling shame and they are feeling guilt. And I promise you what Gomer needed to hear that day was not a church member, was not some religious fanatic, was not somebody who never had a relationship with God that would walk into the place and say, see, I told you, you're nothing. I should have never married you. You're garbage. You're just full of sin. And God hates you because you sin. He did not want to have that happen that day 
The world don't need someone to convince them of their sin. Because I guarantee you the spirit of God goes to and fro this earth. And I promise you there were people that are feeling guilt and feeling shame and feeling hurt and feeling broken. And are looking for someone that would come in and just swell a love say, I want him. I want her. Whatever the cost. He says to her. In verse 3, and I said to her, you shall be betrothed to me for many days. You shall not play the harlot, and you shall not belong to another man. And so will I also be to you until you have proved your loyalty to me and our marital relations may resume. And then right after that, he begins to do what a prophet does, and he begins to prophesy and speak. And he says, for the children of Israel shall dwell and sit deprived many days without a king or prince, without sacrifice or pillar, and without ephod, a garment that's worn by priests when seeking divine counsel or teraphim from the household, small g, gods. They have ran and they've ate the cakes of idols. They've had, eat the fine things at the tables of where worship is offered to idols and they eat the meat that is offered to the idols. And Israel is sitting in these moments, turning their back on God, running from God. And in the midst of all this, God says, he says, there will dwell a time when they're going to be deprived. They'll be without They'll have no answer because I mean, no, you can go right through scripture and you can hear about people that cried out for answers. But I promise you, they never ever got an answer from any small G God ever through the Old Testament. What they got an answer from was just demons and devils and the devil himself. But when the prophets of Baal screamed and cried out and for fire to come from heaven to burn up their idol, they never got an answer. They cut themselves. They screamed and no answer was in sight. But shortly after, the prophet of Elijah stands on the other side, looks over at the 450 prophets of Baal and begins to mock them and laugh at them and say, where's your God? He must be taken asleep. Why don't you shout louder? Maybe he'll hear you. Maybe he's gone out for a walk. I don't know. But he don't seem to be having an answer. And then Elijah, <laughs> Ooh, glory to God, he stands up. He don't cut himself. He don't even scream. He just looks up to heaven and he says, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, answer with fire. <sighs> Burns up the sacrifice. Why? Because our God answers. Small g, he says, you'll not to get any answer from these gods. You'll not get any blessing. But then in verse 5, he says, Afterwards shall the children of Israel return, glory to God, and seek the Lord their God. I mean, big G, seek the God, inquiring of and requiring him. And from the line of David, you've got to remember, he is speaking right now back in the Old Testament. From the line of David, their king, the Amplified, expands it a bit brighter and brings some more understanding to it and says this, their king of kings, because they're talking about David, but they're not truly talking about David in the prophetic sense, they're talking about the line of David, the son of God. They're talking about Jesus because there is an answer that is coming that from the Old Testament prophets have spoken about, shouted about, but there was a day coming when Jesus was going to be born of a virgin in some inn laid in the manger, would grow up just like any other human being, but something different was about him. He was 100% man, but he was 100% God, and he was going to hang and die upon the cross for you and for me. He's speaking of him. And from the line of David, they're king of kings. And they shall come in anxious fear to the Lord and to his goodness and his good things in the latter days. In the latter days. Hosea is being an example 
what God's ultimate plan, and you can read through the Old Testament and see God's plan being revealed in so many of the things that he has the prophets do. And this is one example in particular. And he tells them, he says, go love the same woman. Man messed up. Man slipped up in the garden. But God said, I love them too much to let them go. I love them too much to let them alone. He sends Jesus. Let me say this. There is a world that's looking for an answer. And our arguing of who's right or wrong is not the answer. Our judgment on the world is not the answer. It's the opposite. Jesus said in John 3, 16, and then verse 17, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Before Jesus did not come into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. So if Jesus never came to condemn the world, then what is the responsibility of the church in these last days? It is to be Jesus who did not come to condemn the world, that did not come to point a finger, that did not come to put a list of do's and don'ts and decide who is good enough and who's not good enough. It was a church that came down to say we will be the church that the gates of hell will not prevail against. Why is it that the gates of hell can't prevail against the church? Because you can't kill the love that is wrapped up in it because it's Jesus, the Son of God. Let me read a story. How many people have ever heard of Norma Jean? Norma Jean Mortison. Anybody know that name? Norma Jean's mother was Mrs. Gladys Baker, was periodically committed to the mental institution, and Norma Jean spent most of her childhood in foster homes. In one of those foster homes, when she was eight years old, one of the boarders raped her and gave her a nickel. He said, here, honey, take this, and don't ever tell anyone what I did to you. When little Norma Jane went to her foster mother to tell her what had happened, she was beaten badly. She was told, our border pays good rent. Don't you ever say anything bad about him again. Norma Jean, at the age of eight, had learned what it was to be used and given a nickel and beaten for trying to express the hurt of what was in her. Norma Jean turned into a very pretty young girl. and People began to notice her. Boys whistled at her and she began to enjoy that, but she always wished they would notice that she was a person too. Not just a body or a pretty face, but that she was somebody. Then Norma Jean went to Hollywood and took a new name, Marilyn Monroe. And the publicity people told her, we're going to create a modern sex symbol out of you. And her true reaction was this. A symbol? Aren't symbols things people hit together? They said, honey, it doesn't matter because we're going to make you one of the most smoldering sex symbols that ever hit Hollywood. She was an overnight smash success. But she kept asking the question, did you also notice that I'm a person? Would you please Notice. Then she was cast into many, pardon and excuse the phrase, many dumb blonde roles. Everyone began to dislike Marilyn Monroe that worked with her. She would keep her crews waiting two hours on the set. She was regarded as a selfish woman. What they did not know that she was in her dressing room vomiting because she was so terrified. She kept saying, will someone please notice that I'm a person? Please. They didn't notice, and they wouldn't take her seriously. She went through three marriages, also pleading, take me seriously as a person. But everyone kept saying, no, we just look at you as a sex symbol. You can't be anything other than that. 
Marilyn kept saying, I want to be a person. I want to be taken serious as an actress. I want someone to notice me beyond what they notice about me. I want them to see me. I want them to see my life. I believe there are periods of life where people go through traumatic events and I've sat and I've counseled with so many people that have stopped living because of traumatic events in their life. I remember one girl in particular at 14 years old for two full years she stopped living because her uncle had slept in her came into her room during a drunken party that her mom had thrown and took advantage of her and left her in that bed robbed of her innocence and she stopped living saying I don't want to live anymore and she would curl in her room and hide behind her desk and just cry and weep because nobody noticed the brokenness in her heart. How many people have I talked with that have stopped really living because people don't notice that they need someone to notice. And so on a Saturday night at the age of 35, I'm 34 years old, I can't imagine ever being at this point in my life but at 35 when all beautiful women are supposed to be on the arm of some handsome escort and some handsome man or some place where she's being loved and being treated right Marilyn Rowe took her life and she killed herself when her maid found her body the next morning she noticed a telephone off the hook it was dangling there beside her Later, an investigation revealed that in the last moments of her life, she had called a Hollywood actor and told him she had taken enough sleeping pills to kill herself. He answered with a famous line, which I now edit he, this person saying for church, frankly, my dear, I don't care. It was the last word she heard. She dropped the phone and left it dangling. Claire Boom Loose, in a very sensitive article, was asked, what really killed Marilyn Monroe, love goddess, who never found any love? She said that she thought the dangling phone was a symbol of Marilyn Monroe's whole life. She did because she never got through to anyone who understood. I read this story to say that the world is looking for somebody not even so much to understand, but to love them and to point them to the one who understands, to point them to the one who sticks closer than a brother who will never leave nor forsake. Let me tell you, in Scripture, you will find moments like blind Bartimaeus who sat and was just blind, and everybody just saw blind Bartimaeus as just a blind man, just a beggar on the street. But I mean, oh, when Jesus come along, blind Bartimaeus might have been sitting on the street. He had his beggar's clothes on, but he heard of somebody who's finally taken notice to those who are down and out, and blind Bartimaeus stands up and says, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Shh. Quiet. Don't shout. It's Jesus. Sound familiar? Don't come to our church drunk. It's Jesus. Prostitutes, you stay out of here. This is not the kind of place for you. It's Jesus. Oh, you can't wear that shirt in here. It's Jesus. You can't, you can't look that way in here. It's Jesus. You can't come and act that way in here. It's Jesus. You got to come in and you got to conform and be just like everybody else. And you got to wear your three-piece suit. You got to carry your Bible. You got to do your hair a certain way. You got to make sure you wear your dress. Don't you dare put in earrings. This is Jesus. Shh. It's Jesus. The blind Bartimaeus said, I want an answer. Jesus, thou son of David. The line of David. The line of David. Jesus. He prophesied about him that from the line of David, goodness and mercy is going to show up. He said, here's an example of what I'm going to do. God says, go and love that woman. Though she's up on the stand and though she is being looked at and mocked and laughed at, I want you to buy her. Blind Bartimaeus is sitting here. Jesus says, I want him. Bring him to me. Huh. Blind Bartimaeus comes over. What do you want me to do for you? 
He already took his beggar's cloak. He already took his blind cloak. He threw it off because he knows I'm noticed. My life is about to change. You can read about the woman with the issue of blood. Oh, she's the woman. She smells. She's dirty. She's the woman that... She's the woman that you don't want to be around, and, and she's there. So much so that when she came out of her house, I can see her trying to hide within the crowd, hoping that nobody will notice her because when other people noticed her, what did they notice? They noticed that for 12 years, she's just a sick woman. For 12 years, she had to go down when nobody was watching, and she had to wash in her pool her blood clothes because she couldn't wash her clothes with other people. You see a woman who was saying, would somebody help me out of my hurt and out of my mess would somebody love me and then Jesus came along and we know how the story goes and for the sake of time I, I really don't have time to finish it besides just saying this that she reached out and said if I could just touch his clothes I know I'll be made whole because I heard that he loves people and as she touched him Jesus stopped I'm trying to restrain myself because I want to finish this because it touches me. Somebody touch me. The disciples said, Jesus, there's people everywhere. There's lots of people touching you. No, no, no. Somebody touched me. Somebody of desperateness touched me. Somebody who wouldn't take no for an answer touched me. Somebody of faith touched me. And he said, dunamis power came out of me. And he sees the woman. And finally, somebody with an answer. Whole, still sitting on the ground. Jesus comes, shows up at the pool of Bethesda. A man can't get to the pool because an angel supposedly comes down and stirs the water. And they come and somehow the person who touches the water first gets whole. But, but he had no man. Jesus said, why are you lying there? He said, I have nobody to put me in the water. Nobody to care about me. Nobody to love me. I'm lying on this bed and nobody will bring me to the water when it's stirred. And I've been here too long. But Jesus noticed him. Jesus saw him with love and no strings attached. How did he love him? I'll buy her. I'm going to love her like that. Bring him here. I'm going to love him like that. Woman, you're whole. I'm going to love you like that. You don't need the pool, my friend. I'm going to love you like that. And oh, that the church would break out of the walls and love a community with no strings attached. That we won't see a prostitute up on the post waiting for someone to buy her so she can live her life in misery. That the drug addict looking for his next high. That we won't see the woman who's been with man after man. That we won't see the man who's not known how to treat a woman. That we won't see all these things but when we go out into our community that we would get the heart of God and say I want him. I want her. I'm going to love like that because I can't love like that outside of him but he's in me. And the, mm, the measure of my love for him and his love for me is visible in a way that we love like that. Love, no strings attached. Church, it goes beyond a nice worship song. It goes beyond a friendly face in church. It goes beyond a message like this. It's the heart of the Father. It's the heart of God. And my challenge to this church, well, we will go out and do something collectively as a body. We will go out and, and portray the love of God as a church family. But my challenge beyond all that to the church is individually the same God 
that spoke to Hosea, the same Jesus who said, I want him, I want her. It's the same God that's in you and in I. So Ken Sunrise Ministries be known in our city. It's not just another religious facade of a church. Can we be known in the city as just not a nice place to worship? Can we be known as the city of when people meet you on the streets and you begin to love them like that, that people would connect you and say, oh, they must go to sunrise because I don't know anybody else who loves like that. What is love? No strings attached. You will never find it in your own strength. But God, while we were yet sinners, while we were yet in our mess, Did anybody see that? Because if you can't see the mess he rescued her from, I don't care if you've never smoked, you've never drank, you've never said a curse word in your life. I don't care if you've never ever treated a person wrong, supposedly. I don't care if you think that you live the perfect Christian life. Let me tell you something outside of Jesus. Hell was what you deserved. That's what I deserved. And if I recognized that, and I deserved hell, but while I was up on this auction block, a slave to sin, and the devil taunting, and the people laughing, and feeling shame and guilt, and knowing I am lost if he don't show up, in walks Jesus. I want John Rogers. <laughs> I want John Rogers. I want Selby. I want Kimberly. I want Corey. Can you see that church? That's love. I don't care how much you love people and you think you love them. If you don't love them with God's kind of love, you don't know love. Love don't quit on people. But let me say this. I started off by reading scripture. That what happens is that he loves us, and his love will chase us. But you have to receive his love. Because no person, no man, no woman, no money, nothing can change your life like he can change your life. See, it's natural. It's natural to love them that love us. But it's supernatural to love them that hate us. And that's what he was talking about. Nails in his hands. Father, forgive them. Yeah, but that was Jesus. Oh, yeah? That was Jesus. Well, let me show you Jesus in somebody. Stephen. Where rocks are being fired at him. <laughs> Hitting him in the head and in the body and about to kill him. He says, Father, don't hold this sin against them. I'm letting them off with it, so you let them off with it. I don't, I don't hate them. And he loved them as they were stoning him. That was Jesus in Stephen. Who is Jesus in you? Can you bow your heads with me? As you're bowed, I just want you to hear this. Show me a church where there's love. And I will show you a church where that is a power in the community that changes lives. In Chicago, several years back, a little boy attended a Sunday school. And when his parents moved to another part of the city, this little father still, still attended the same Sunday school. Although it meant long, tiresome walks each way. A friend asked him, why do you keep going there? There's another Sunday school right over here. 
There's lots of other Sunday schools that's closer to you. Why do you keep walking over there? He said, there may be other Sunday schools, good for other people, but not for me. Why not? He was asked. Because they sure do love a fellow over there. I've seen kids walk down through the snow up to their knees with a pair of sneakers that didn't fit just so we can get to kids for Christ. Because we love. As we're bowed in his presence, (laughs) if you're here, And you've tried to find that kind of love that would love you like that, but you've come up empty. I want to introduce you today to the one who says, I want you. To the one that says, I love you. Because I promise you, you could search this whole world through, but you will never find that kind of love outside of him. Some of you know people in and out of relationships. Some of you know people that are searching yet coming up empty, getting moments of instant gratification, getting moments of quick fixes, getting moments of like a drug dealer looking for their next high. Somebody's looking for someone to see them, someone to notice them. We wonder why our young girls are dressing the way they're dressing and doing the things they're doing and giving up so easily to the first guy that comes along. They're looking for someone to notice them. But so many of them come into churches that are outdated because they're too afraid to change. They come into churches that are afraid to sing a new song. They come into churches that are afraid to have their music a bit loud. They come into churches that are afraid to wear anything less than a three-piece suit. They come into churches that are afraid to let their walls down thinking we got to be the religious facade that everybody else is. Instead of being a church that say we will love and it's about reaching the world for Jesus. Oh, that we would be that place. Sunrisers, let the sun rise in your life. Because when he rises in your life, you will love like that. Holy Spirit, do what I can. Break through the coldness. Break through hearts of stone. Break through the walls of rejection. Break through Holy Spirit, go where I can't. Do what I can't. to do something before we leave if you're here and you're willing I stand here and say God I can't on my own but God I'm willing to do everything in my strength and even better to do everything that the spirit leads me to do to love like you love but God I stand there saying I want to love like that And you as a church and as a church family and as those as believers, as we sing this song, if you could find it in your heart to passionately say, I'm leaving all my stuff behind. I'm leaving all of my desires right here. I'm leaving all of my whys and all of what about me and all of those things right here because I'm going to go and love like that. Church, would you join me? same pastor we're gonna love like that 
Well, thanks for watching. We hope you enjoyed today's message, which ends off our series, Love, No Strings Attached. Um, if this series has somehow touched your life over the last little bit, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, please email us at yourstory@sunriseministries.ca at and just to share something with us about how this has touched your life. Um, also, if you'd like to know more about our church or if you'd like for us to pray with you, please visit our website at www.sunriseministries.ca. Again, thanks for watching um, and we'll see you again next week.